Coach Bad has now been around for three seasons and coaches everywhere are saving time and being more efficient when it comes to scout cards. Coach Robinson from Texas says, the thing I most enjoy is the ease of access to all the scout cards and how I can draw on them if I need to make any changes. Every coach that uses it says that it is so great to use. If you and your staff are tired of the old ways of preparing and using scout cards, check out thecoachpad.com to start enjoying scout team and making the 2023 season better than ever. Uh, Welcome back to another episode of the Gap Downbacker podcast. Uh, Today we have the head football coach at Nelson County High School in Kentucky, um, Coach Philip Stockdale. Coach, how you doing? I'm doing well, man. How are you doing today? Doing good. Can't complain. Uh, wouldn't do me any good if I did. Um, Nobody listen. I hear you. Yeah, no, especially our, my wife. She'll just turn me out. So um, just, I mean, kind of how do you end up as the head football coach at Nelson County? Um, I've been coaching 20 years and uh, been in education a total of 26, I think. Uh, and it's just uh, pure luck, I guess. Um, I started coaching uh, at a place called Powell County High or Green County High School, really. It was right next to where I went to school. Uh, moved around quite a bit. Uh, spent some time in Tennessee. Uh, ended up uh, taking a few years off from coaching uh, to help. I have an adult son with autism who's an actor. And uh, I took a few years off from coaching, tried to be a school administrator. And uh, and then I was a stage dad for, for a few years there um, and uh, got back into it at uh, Mayo High School with a good friend of mine who I played college football with. And my wife was working in Nelson County schools and she really liked it. Uh, so we decided to move to Bardstown. I was still at Mayo. Uh, we were in the state championship. It was 2019. And the AD from Nelson County called me and asked me if I was interested in the job. And I'm like, well, no, you know, we're – I'm at Mayo. We're getting ready for a state title game. I was thinking about nothing but that. And then I got home, and, and we ended up losing. Lost to Trinity uh, after beating them in the regular season. They beat us in the uh, finals. And then uh, got home that that Christmas break, and you know, was just sitting there thinking about it. And the school was eight miles from my house. You know, it's just right down the road. Uh, we were living in Bardstown, so that wouldn't. You know, I didn't have to move. And I'd been wanting to be a head coach for a long time. And I've always wanted to uh, either, I've always wanted to either start a program for scratch or rebuild a program. Uh, Nelson County won a state championship in the largest classification in 1996. So they got some good tradition here, but they'd fallen on some hard times. Uh, and I just, uh, you know, I was like, this is a rebuilding effort. I, I, I'd like to do it. So I called the AD, talked to him for about 30 minutes, realized that he was all in on building a football program and I'd have all the support I needed. So we, uh, I applied for it and talked to him a little bit more and ended up getting the job. And, and that's, that's how we ended up here in Nelson County. Okay. Now, now we talked a little bit beforehand. You've kind of always been involved. I mean, your first play you learned was beer. Um, you've always, I mean, your whole playing career was pretty much in the, the yeah. option. What has that transition been like from, um, playing in the, how much, or I'll phrase this, how much has it helped you playing in the option to what you do now? Uh, well, just just knowing the different variations of it. Like I said, we we were split back veer in high school. Uh, we run a little bit out of the eye. We were wishbone in college. Uh, I got with my, the guy that I coached with at Mayo. I coached with him before at a place called Hancock County uh, in Western Kentucky. And we were flexbone. We run some wing T, a lot of wing T stuff. And then we ran a, a, a lot of tr- some triple option uh, with him. And uh, just understanding, you know, just the different variations of it that I played in was really good. And then I was not <laughs> a good football player. Uh, I ended up being a college football player just because, number one, I just – I played so hard and I was so daggone mean um, and aggressive that I was able to be successful. And, you know, I've come to believe over the years that the triple option is the best way to compete with less talent. Uh, I think the wing tee is a close second. And then I think the run and shoot Mike Leach style air raid where you're throwing it 50 times a game is probably the third uh, offense I would choose if I was uh, with less talent. And uh, I've only been at a couple of places where we week in and week out had superior talent. So I knew if I ever took a job, I was going to run, uh, run the triple. Okay. Now, I mean, like what, I mean, you've mentioned it a little bit there, but let's dig deeper. 
why do you think that benefits the i mean whether it be wing t or triple like arc and or even double wing why do you think those seem to be great equalizers and help the struggling program so much uh i think the biggest thing is you know you can cancel the defensive line by reading them uh and make them wrong so you don't have to you know that's the biggest thing. The number one thing we always look at is are, are there defensive linemen we can't block? Uh, and if we do, we're just going to read him or in the wing tee and we run some trap and down and stuff like that. We're going to trap him if we can. So it, I think it gives you an opportunity to take away a really good defensive lineman. Um, you know, you got a really good linebacker. You can run away from him and make him chase you down. But if you got a defensive lineman up front that you can't block, then you're going to have trouble running anything. Uh, so I like the idea that it can cancel uh, a couple good defensive linemen. Um, and it, like I said, you know, we run things in series, play I like the wing tee. Everything starts out looking the same, and you put uh, you put their best players in a bind. Okay. Now, now you mentioned series there. Like, what is your install progression? What do you package together series-wise? Um, we start everything with the inside veer. Uh, that's our first play that we teach. And with the inside veer, uh, off of that, we have a play. We call it Sally, uh, which is a counter play to the, to the slot. Um, and we package that with the Sally and, of course, the play action. And then this year, um, I got into the midline triple. Uh, had been looking at that for a couple years and just really dove into it this past winter uh, because the biggest thing was we were having trouble getting to the pitch. Uh, and, I, and I read a lot of stuff and researched the mid, mid triple and figured that was the best way for us to get to the pitch and get on the edge. Uh, so we package those, uh, those four together, and that's our triple option series right there. Okay. So do you run any outside veer at all, or is it just mostly the inside and the uh, crap midline? It's, it's, it's all inside and mid triple. We've thought about the veer and I've looked at it and, uh, you know, I, I also, like I said, I run some down and run counters off that and we do some rocket toss. Uh, and I just, I didn't think that the number of times we would have needed to run it after going back and looking at the film, I just don't think the time was worth uh, the, you know, the, the practice time versus how many times we run it in the game would really be worth it. So, we don't do any outside beer. And we, like I said, I, every winter I go back and forth and I kind of look at everything again. And it just hasn't been to the point where I think it's going to be something that's ultra beneficial to us. Okay. Now, now, kind of with that, I mean, you mentioned your practice time and obviously it's limited because there's so much you got to work on as it is. How do you typically structure, say, like that first install of inside beer in practice? Uh, we start with, um, and we break it down with the, the skills first. So we zone block the option. Um, so we'll go individual, of, our individuals, our basic fundamental periods. And then that first uh, installation is we'll have the offensive linemen learn what we call the zone count system. Um, they learn the zone count system. My, uh, my receivers are, are learning how to stock block because we start everything out with just a basic stock blocking. And then we are doing uh, with our quarterbacks and fullbacks and our, uh, our slots, or we call them wise, we're doing uh, the just basic footwork. And then we get into the two ball drill working on our reads. And those are the first things we, we teach off of that. And then we'll come together as a, uh, as a team and we'll run, start running it as a team. I was, just, I was just curious. Everybody kind of installs it a little bit differently and how yeah. they, they approach the system. And, yeah. um, and again, it also block it a little differently. Some go to the zone section, like you kind of mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and some go more of a, the old, I don't know, I almost call it gap scheming, but like the veer blocking, the true veer block. Yeah, where everybody's scooping backside and stuff yeah. like it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, what, what, I mean, to continue with the zone veer, um, like what do you, like, cause I, obviously a lot of people probably, I'm not saying probably no, probably run the uh, veer blocking a little bit more than the zone. Yeah. Typically, what do you think, especially for somebody looking at the zone version, what they might miss in terms of installing it or teaching it? 
Um, well, the biggest thing is with us is uh, we, you've got to get we like I said we get you got to get the count right. Um, so what we do is uh, we we say we look at the defense and our center's responsible for it, and he's got to figure out who's responsible for the backside a gap, and that becomes zero. Uh, then everybody to the play side is one, two, three, four. And everybody to the backside is negative one, two, three, or four. Um, and then the, the players from there figure out how they're going to block it. Uh, based on how they're lined up, we might get a double team. We might get a zone combo to the linebacker. We may just turn people out uh, off of that. So that's the biggest thing is if you're going to zone block it, um, you got to have a system where the kids know, all right, who are we blocking? And the next, how are we blocking them? Are we going to combo them? We're going to solo them? You know, just turn them out. Uh, how are we going to going to do that? And that's the biggest thing. If you're looking at the zone portion of it, um, is is making sure that you get them numbered right or however you want to identify. Them, but the but the guys know who we're comboing and who we're who we're working up to and who we're reading. Okay. Now, I mean, you you also mentioned Sally play action and midline triple are part of your inside yeah. veer package, but. How like how many days do you stick with your inside view before you start adding the Sally and the midline? Like what is like like I like the great example is the air raid people who typically do a three day install and then come mm-hmm. back and add their tags. Yeah. Um, I talked to a triple option guy a couple weeks ago and it, it was pretty much a two day install, two days of inside view, then two days of the next play, and um, yeah, just to clean up the techniques. How do you approach that? We. Um... In the beginning, like I said, I didn't start running midline until this year. Uh, but in the beginning, we spent uh, we'd spend an entire week on the veer on the series. Uh, and what we would do is like day one, we would do uh, we would install the uh, that we start installed you know the inside veer, and then we would do one play action combo off of that. And then the next day we were veer, and then we started hitting the sally, and then we put our other combos like we'll run a of, you know, a, a vertical concept off the play action. We'll run a switch concept and then we'll run some kind of flat where we're getting vertical and running a flat or an arrow uh, out of that too. Um, so we kind of, we would install each day we did the inside beer, we would have a play action off of it. And then once we put in the Sally and the great thing about that is with the blocking scheme, using the zone blocking scheme, the only two people that change when you run the Sally is the play side tackle and the fullback. Everybody else stays the same. So there's really not much install in the Sally. So we took about a week uh, to do it um, the very first year. And then now this past season, uh, we did we did it in about two days. We, we went through everything in two days because we had a lot of returning starters. And next year we'll probably spend – it'll be more of the three- to four-day install because we're going to have a lot of new guys. But uh, this year we were able – like I said, we had a lot of returners, so we were able to kind of roll through it. They understood the veer. Yeah. Now, I mean, with that, like when, when, when you're looking at the triple and looking at installing it and adding those play actions and so forth, how much does your um, play progression, install progression, like you mentioned it change a little bit, you're a little quicker this year's yeah. experience, next year probably be longer. How much does some of that stuff change your year? Like you added midline triple when you're evaluating or self scouting yourself, how do you go about not only approaching yourself scout and determining what you need to add, what you keep yeah. rid of, but how you're going to approach install the next year? Uh, well, we look at the way we've done it is the first year was well, my COVID year. So we were kind of, it was, I mean, it wasn't a real preseason. We kind of had to do everything kind of fast. So we spent the next spring ball on what we're going to add and what, what's going to be new. So that first year we had spring practice, and we didn't get to have it during COVID year. The next year was all option stuff. Um, we put in, we, we worked nothing but inside veer, Sally, our play actions, and we ran one run and shoot concept, a rub concept, is the only drop back stuff we put in. And we worked all that in the spring, and then just over and over and over again, and installed that in the spring. And then when we came back in the fall, uh, we, you know, we stuck to it and then we moved on to our, uh, we tried to, in my infinite wisdom, I thought I was going to marry triple option and RPO, um, which was a colossal failure. Um, and, 
you know, we spent some time, we spent a lot of time on RPOs and we realized it wasn't going to work for us. Um, but it'll, it'll change a little bit. And then the following year, you know, we come out and we decided we were going to do midline triple. So our spring was mainly, and we still run our play action, our sallies, but all the triple stuff we did was midline over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, and then we came back to the Veer uh, in the preseason uh, and then brushed up on it. Okay. Now, now um, with that, like, how, I mean, how much formationally do you do? And, and I mean, cause you, you mentioned you, 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 when you played in it or, and you've had some experience coaching at other places, you've, you've done it out of the flex bone, you've done it out of the eye, you've done it out of the wishbone. Okay. How much do you mess with formations and what, what you do? We, uh, we're, we're pretty much exclusively flex bone and variations off of that. Um, we don't do any, any stuff where we've got two backs in the backfield. Uh, we've got our, always got our two, our Ys, our, our slots there. Uh, but we'll motion them. Uh, you know, we'll do uh, – we worked a little bit this year with the return motion. Um, you know, we'll motion one guy across the set and run option back to the weak side. Uh, we got into flexing our, uh, our, our wide receivers, or we call them our Xs. We got into flexing those guys this year. Um, we did more formationally uh, this year than we have. You know, we would loosen up uh, one of our Ys. We call it – we just tag it loose, and he would loosen up, and we would run the option to that – look almost a twins look out there. Um, and then we got into some uh, red and blue, the old school, you know, wing T, red and blue with the tight end wing on one side. Uh, but we, we'll, we'll do a lot of just variations off the flex bone formation. Uh, you know, we're not going to get in the eye or the wishbone or anything like that. Um, but we'll, we'll do a lot of variations of the flex bone. We'll run trips and we'll run a, a tight trip we call snug. And then, like I said, we'll flex guys and, and motion them across the sets and different things like just a little window dressing to, to get people maybe see if they move. If they move, we'll take advantage of it. If they don't, then we'll do, uh, we'll work on something else. Okay. Now, the other thing you mentioned there is you, you mentioned some run and shoot and I like Navy's added a lot of the passing mm -hmm. concepts over the years. Yeah. I know uh, Paul Johnson worked some of that concept and formationally just fits. Like if you look, if you read the old run and shoot. Yeah. Um, uh, but the original run and shoot and even the the second book by Al Black, um, like how much do you play with run and shoot concepts and what, what you, you mentioned a little bit there, but we, uh, just, just formationally it, it fits. Yeah, it fits. Go. we uh, we'll run uh, the rub concept and I, I think it's, I think they might've called it gangster pass in the original one. Uh, we'll do the rub concept where we'll motion to that. We call it snub. We, if we line up in it, we call it snub, but we'll motion that wing across and he'll rub the flat defender. So you got, you got your outside receiver, uh, outside releasing, getting vertical, and then you rub that flat defender. And then you got your inside wire that'll run the flat route and you read the corner. We run that quite a bit, um, especially against teams that want to go man against us. And then we'll run, if we get the zone, we get the one high look, we'll run a read concept where that second receiver, you know, we motion him across. It looks just like rub. And then he runs at the free safety and we decide, you know, our rules are if he's dropping, I'm stopping. He's even, I'm leaving. He crosses me, I cross him. And we read that guy. So those are really the two that we, that we work with the most out of that. We've worked on some backside choice stuff, but uh, we haven't really gotten to the point where we can do that really well. Okay. Like, I'm just curious because I know it, like we played with yeah. a little bit when I was at Fairborn and some of the wing T stuff we did. And like, obviously college level, they run a lot more of it. Right. Uh, the formationally it fits up and it's, yeah, it works really well. All right. Um, and then like, I will go back to practice real quick. Cause that's, I think it, I mean, you can pull up scheme. That's that, that's the easy. Yeah. But I mean, is there anything you do that's either unique or that you like that's a heavy focus or that you think you do really well practice drill wise? Um, I think we do. We spend we have uh, our practice is organized. You know, we'll get out there and we have flex. We get the guys warmed up. Uh, we hit our special teams first. Um, I think that's very important. Uh, the best places I've been, we always get special teams the first part of practice. Uh, I think coaches, a lot of coaches give it lip service, but they, it's kind of an afterthought. But we really, really focus on our special teams, try to make breaks in that part of the game. Um, and then we go into our individual period, which is all everyday fundamental drills. Um, 
And we'll do like on Tuesday, we, we play with a lot of guys both ways. So our time is really, really limited. So on Tuesdays, we'll do our individual periods and we'll go, we'll get it down to about 10 to 12 minutes offense, 10 to 12 minutes defense. And then we'll do group on Tuesday. And then that group is we'll do, you know, we'll get into uh, our inside drills, our two ball drill, our inside drills. And, uh, and then of course, defensively, we're doing inside and, and pass Skelly at that period of time. And then Wednesday, after we flex and do special teams, it's all team stuff, offensively and defensively. Um, and then the uh, Tuesdays too, we work some individual period in there, where it's like it's something that we see the week before we really got to focus on. Like if our gap combo, if our combos weren't crisp, we'll spend a whole period on nothing but combo blocks. Um, one of the things we really had to get better at this year was our perimeter blocking. So a lot of our individual period was, you know, that arc release blocking that alley player uh, on the triple. And then, you know, switch block, we switch block the midline quite a lot. So we spent a lot of time doing that, but we kind of got away from doing on an offensive day and a defensive day and kind of split it up and like, all right, we're going to do our individual and group on Tuesday. We're going to do our team on Wednesday. Uh, because we just we, – we, if we didn't touch the triple at all on Wednesday, we – just the carryover weren't there for us. So we got a little bit of offense, a little bit of defense each day uh, for the kids going into Thursdays, you know, polish up and Friday's game. Yeah. The last question I want to ask you is, I mean, you probably get a bunch of dumb looks um, or junk defenses or the, oh, yeah. or the defenses of the week. I mean, that's just when you run an under center, heavy running offense. That, I mean, that's typically what you get, whether it's wing T, double wing, triple, doesn't matter. Like, so how do you deal with the um, just junk defenses? Um, really, the hardest part of dealing with the junk defenses is the perimeter stuff. Um, our zone count system, once the kids understand how that works, we can block the interior pretty, pretty easy. Uh, and, you know, we'll get – Double A gaps, double B gaps. Um, I got a uh, – uh, the second year here, we got a team that ran a nose, uh, two four – they ran a fifth – an odd front. So, they had the nose, two four eyes, and then they had a Mike linebacker and then a linebacker behind him and two other outside linebackers uh, as well. Um, it's kind of a, some kind of a version of the 3-3 three, three stack. But we work really hard on the perimeter, knowing, okay – we know who our dive read is. Now, who are we going to read on the pitch? And and who are we going to block and how are we going to block? Are we just going to, you know, block it straight or are we going to, we're going to switch block it? So the hardest thing with the junk ones is they do all that stuff inside the box and then it, it kind of messes with our perimeter guys a little bit. Um, so, you know, we just – we work through, you know, if we've got two guys outside the wing, this, this is who we're blocking, and, and one guy. And then we've also added in some tight side option this year which kind of changes up our perimeter blocking a little bit too. Okay. But that's the biggest challenge is making sure my my guys know am I arc releasing to the alley guy? Am I releasing linebacker to safety? You know, how are we how are we blocking it on the perimeter? Okay. So coaches, uh, give coach a follow. Uh, his bio will be – his Twitter handle will be in the bio. Uh, so give coach a follow uh, if you want to chat with them. He's also very – he's also fairly active on uh, some of the Facebook triple groups. Uh, that's kind of how me and him uh, got together. Um, like, share, subscribe, all that lovely jazz. Check out our sponsor, Coach Pad. Um, otherwise, that is another episode of the Gap Down Backer podcast.